Hello everybody and welcome to this, which is the second of three seminars launching the interim report of the Working Group on Unification Referendums on the Island of Ireland. I'm Meg Russell, Professor of British and Comparative Politics at UCL and Director of the Constitution Unit, and I'll be chairing the event today. As most people here probably already know, the Working Group is a project led by the Constitution Unit's Deputy Director, Dr. Alan Rennick, involving an international team of experts and examining how any future referendum on the constitutional status of Northern Ireland would best be designed and conducted. It doesn't look at or take a view on whether such votes would be desirable or what the outcome should be if referendums were to be held. Let me start by personally thanking and congratulating the members of the working group for what they've done. It's a really thorough, important and fascinating piece of work. We've got four speakers today to discuss the report and its contents. First, two members of the working group will introduce the report and then we'll have two commentators. So the first speaker will be Alan Rennick, the working group's chair. He'll be followed by Alan Weissel, who's a member of the group, a former Northern Ireland office civil servant and a Constitution Unit Honorary Senior Research Fellow. We'll then hear from Claire Salters, also a former senior civil servant in the Northern Ireland office and Northern Ireland constitutional advisor. And then finally from Martin Kettle, associate editor and columnist at The Guardian. After a few minutes of opening remarks from each of the speakers, we'll have some brief discussion among the panel before opening it up to audience questions. The questions will be facilitated by Connor Kelly, research assistant and project manager for the working group. When it gets to the question part, if you'd like to put a question to the panel, please write it in the chat, but do so in a private message addressed to Connor Kelly rather than to everyone on the call. He'll then select a broad range of questions to read out. It's important to note that the working group's report is an interim report setting out preliminary conclusions. The group wants to hear feedback, so please use today's Q&A session to begin that conversation. And also note that we're inviting written feedback until the 18th of January on the Constitution Unit website where you can access the full report and an, exec and, and an executive summary of it. This whole session, including the Q&A part, is being recorded and after the event, it'll be posted on the Constitution Unit's YouTube channel. And with those uh, initial bits of admin, I'm now going to hand over to our first speaker, Alan Rennick, Chair of the Working Group, to introduce the report. Alan. Uh, thank you very much, Meg, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. Um, I'd like to give a quick introduction to three things, um, why we created the working group, the nature of the working group, and the group's interim conclusions. So we created the working group because referendums on the unification question might happen. If they happen, it's important that they be conducted well. And they can be conducted well only if someone thinks through what that would involve. Um, but no one has yet done that thinking fully, and so we wanted to help fill that gap. Um, we did not create the working group because we thought that referendums are imminent. The evidence is, the, is that a majority in Northern Ireland would currently vote for maintaining the union, not for unification. But clearly, no one can know how opinion might evolve over time. On the nature of the working group, as Meg said, the group is looking at how any future referendums on the constitutional status of Northern Ireland would best be designed and conducted. We have no collective view on whether such votes would be desirable or what the outcome should be if referendums were to be held. The group is based, as Meg said, at the Constitution Unit here at UCL. Uh, it comprises 12 experts from Queen's University Belfast, Ulster University, Trinity College Dublin, University College Dublin and the University of Pennsylvania, as well as UCL, with expert expertise spanning political science, law, sociology and history. And let me just say as chair of the working group that I'm immensely grateful to all of the members of the group for their tremendous work and dedication throughout the project. Uh, turning to the group's interim conclusions, I can give you, alas, only some brief highlights. It's a detailed report examining many complex issues. As a starting point, we assume that any referendums would be conducted within the terms of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement of 1998. And so we start by setting out what that entails. As is well known, unification could not happen without a referendum vote in its favour in Northern Ireland. We conclude that a referendum would be required in the South as well, either amending or replacing the constitution. 
the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland must call a referendum if a majority for unification appears to him or her likely. A referendum in the South wouldn't have to be on the same day, it could come later, but substantially the same proposal would have to be put to voters both North and South. The threshold in each referendum would be a simple majority of 50% plus one. If that threshold were met in both jurisdictions, unification would then have to take place. So the majority principle applies to the decision on sovereignty itself. But on other matters, the 1998 agreement's wider ethos of seeking to proceed by consensus should be upheld as far as possible. So that's the 1998 agreement, um, but there are many other matters that the agreement does not resolve. We explore these using five criteria to assess the options relating to procedural legitimacy, stability, simplicity, informed choice and inclusivity. And let me state three broad conclusions that we reach based on these criteria. First, it would be highly unwise for referendums to be called without a clear plan for the referendums and other associated processes. These would be complex processes and poorly designed could lead to problems. Such a plan would need to be agreed by the governments in close consultation with others. We do not say when such planning should begin. And I want to be clear on that because it has been the subject of some misinterpretation since the report was published. We nowhere say that either government should now start to prepare for a referendum, but a plan should be agreed by the time any referendum is called. Second, there are several plausible configurations of referendums north and south, with referendums coming either early in the process before the details of a United Ireland have been worked out, or later once a plan has been developed. I won't go into detail now, though I'm happy to do so in Q&A, but let me just say for now that there is no perfect approach. Each configuration has advantages and disadvantages. Finally, the conduct rules for any referendums would be crucial. Existing campaign rules are badly out of date in the digital age in both the UK and Ireland and urgently need to be strengthened. As I said, those are just some very quick headlines, but I hope they give a flavour of what we're about. This is an interim report, as Meg said, presenting draft conclusions. So now we're really keen to hear your feedback. Thank you very much, Alan. And uh, it's a large report. There's so much more to say. Um, let's see what Alan Weissel would like to uh, add. Alan, would you like to speak to us? Do unmute yourself. Uh, you can hear me now, I hope. Um, uh, uh, sorry, eating from my time. I'd like to focus on three or four uh, aspects of, of, of our recommendations, building on what Alan said. The first of those is when the Secretary of State should call a border poll. Uh, he must do so if he thinks it would yield a majority for Irish unity. And as Alan said, we don't, looking at the evidence, think that that is imminent. We don't think the preparation has to begin. But a great deal will turn on the Secretary of State commanding trust across the community in Northern Ireland and more widely about his decision here. And it's a very difficult decision. We didn't feel that we could develop any simple formula uh, about how he should decide these issues. The different kinds of evidence that he needs to look at are all imperfect. That includes election results, opinion polls, other political evidence. They all need to be assessed in their context. We try to offer some pointers. If opinion became more finely balanced, we suggest he would benefit from further expert advice. But opinion polls are, tend to, to, to draw the headlines. Uh, just to say a bit more about that, online polling so far has tended to show a good deal more support for unity than other sorts of polling, like the face-to-face -face sort done by the Northern Ireland Life and Times Survey. If the polls agreed, they would be very much more convincing, but it's hard to argue at the moment, we think that one form of polling should be preferred over the other. So polling is, is equivocal. In any event, uh, as Bill, Bill White, the head of Lucid Talk, the Northern Ireland polling company, and I think is, is with us today has said, uh, this is not verbatim, but I think I got the sense of it, it's hard to put much confidence in the predictive capacity of polling at the moment, ahead of a full debate on all the issues. And that's why we think that a, a, an informed and a comprehensive debate is, is important. 
to assess the current balance of evidence, you need to add in election results, and they don't at the moment suggest anything like a majority for unity. If we ever got to the stage where there was a majority assembly vote for unity, that would, I think, in many ways, change the terms of the debate uh, very significantly. But we're quite a long way from 50% support for nationalist parties at the moment. If I then turn to the process for getting to a united Ireland, as Anna said, it's inescapably a majority decision. Once you've had referendums in both parts of the island, showing by a majority uh, a, 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 a preference for unity, unity in some form must happen. But the rest of the agreement is suffused, as James Mallon's pointed up, with the need for consensus. The agreement itself was reached by consensus. Consensus underpins the institutions, underpins much of their daily decision making. It's hard to see how the requirement of that would all go away in the context of unity. And so we think that consensus in developing the form of the United Ireland that flows from the referendums is very important. Uh, and we make some suggestions about that, but it's far from simple. The simplest arrangement would be that you have engagement with all traditions, including unionism, ahead of referendums. Realistically, that isn't likely to happen. Unionists, reasonably, in my view, uh, uh, but, but in any event, in reality, are not going to divide their time between campaigning against Irish unity and planning what it would look like. So we suggest a couple of configurations in which though that negotiation would follow uh, the initial referendums, followed by further referendums on, on what was proposed with the aim of achieving consensus there, as with the, as with the agreement. The trouble is, this is uh, really uh, results, and this is part, part of the reason for the bulk of the report, in, 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 in very complicated structures, because if the, the negotiation is to work properly, it mustn't give the opportunity for a veto uh, 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 on a united island, otherwise unionism reasonably will, will fight the battle all over again. So there is a real conundrum here about how you reconcile the principles, the majority principle of majoritarianism about the constitutional status and consensus about, about the result. Much more thoughts needed on that as well. I will just briefly point out chapter seven of our report, which sets out really the agenda for uh, a discussion on what a united Ireland should look like. Uh, 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 we go through a whole range of issues in, I think we can modestly say a good deal more detail uh, a good deal more comprehensiveness than has been done before about the architecture of the Irish state is a unitary state is there involved on land is it federal uh, a lot of the very difficult decisions that would need to be made about things like finance about identity issues whether there's a new Irish constitution how how far uh, and how do you fuse institutions of policing how do you fuse health provision uh, a lot of issues here that need more analysis uh, which we don't seek to give, we don't comment on the substance, uh, 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 but which really need to be resolved. And although we're, we're not trotting them out in, in, uh, by way of suggesting that uh, it's all too difficult, and indeed we point to some of the factors which make this perhaps uh, a, an easier set of circumstances to deal with than some other reunification contexts, nevertheless, uh, 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 there are difficult issues and you can't be assumed that they can all be resolved by a sufficiency of political will. Finally, briefly, since we're in London, uh, 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 what should the government do in response? Two things, I suggest. We, we don't suggest it's time to start, start planning and preparation. But trust in the integrity and even handedness in, of the government in making decisions about whether to call a poll is essential. And this could become a, a live issue soon. We could get more online polls suggesting a majority for unity. We've registered our doubts about relying on that evidence alone. Uh, but uh, 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 there are, it seems to me, people around in the community in Northern Ireland who now do think that a majority for unity is just around the corner. Uh, and they entirely reasonably see the provis provisions on constitutional status as the, the cornerstone of the agreement. So there has got to be a belief that the, that the British government is playing fair. Uh, it's essential to, that it shows itself to be assessing opinion uh, impartially and transparently and sensibly in the course it adopts, it, whether that's saying more about how it will weigh the evidence, whether it's about looking to independent advice, uh, uh, London would sensibly seek to, to, to bring Dublin with it. it it's inescapable the Secretary of State's decision whether the, uh, 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 there is a majority, but nevertheless, he should, he should consult and seek to, as I say, bring others along with him. The other final thing is 
to recognize the border pole, and some extent even the suggestion that it's imminent, changes the nature of politics in Northern Ireland. Most political parties in Northern Ireland seek to appeal to one part of the community. But in the context of a border poll, they have to seek to uh, uh, appeal across communities and to have the arguments and the people to make them uh, in that context. The government might want to encourage that mentality. It might, and since they're openly supporters of the union, uh, they might also want to act that way. So saying how admirable uh, uh, the present union arrangements are, uh, putting union jacks on vaccine bottles, which I think was suggested in the Scottish context, uh, may cheer the existing supporters of the union, it's unlikely to bring converts. That needs a, a more thoughtful approach to ensuring the settlement within the United Kingdom satisfies aspirations and identities across the community. And I think much more attention needs to be given to that, but that's a different project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. That was um, that was really fascinating and begins to give a flavour, I think, for the complexity of some of these issues and the, the kind of conundrums and trade-offs. And I think that's why this report is really important, because just to just to demonstrate that complexity and get people thinking about some of those things well ahead of time. Uh, but now I'm beginning to be a commentator and that's, that's dangerous because we have two commentators. Let me just say, in case anybody didn't notice, uh, there's something that I should have said at the start um, about if you're tweeting uh, about this event, we encourage you to tweet. Um, and Charlotte has put into the chat a hashtag for the event, hashtag events CU, CU for Constitution Unit. And please also mention the Constitution Unit uh, Twitter account in your tweets. So now we're going to turn to our commentators um, and I'll hand over first to Claire. Tell us your thoughts on the report, Claire. Thank you, Meg. Um, I suppose I'd like to begin just by congratulating the report's authors on producing something that's so comprehensive and lucid and logical on what's obviously a very complex and politically charged subject. In my view, the, the interim report is a, an illustration of the value that independent analysis can play in a politically contested space, helping to illuminate issues and, if you like, define the conundrum faced by those with responsibility for implementing the agreement and its outworkings. As, as a general point, certainly for me, the level of detail and objective analysis in the report is an absolute pleasure to read in a world where we've become accustomed to dialogue taking place through the medium of pithy and often subjective and sometimes ill-informed tweets and social media, the investment of intellectual effort in churning through both the nerdy detail and its practical outworkings is very welcome. Um, Alan was talking there about the, the models and, and um, sequencing of, of the, the, the forms a referendum could take. And I was particularly pleased that the report recommends against, at least in its draft recommendations, against a referendum without a clearly defined idea of the practicality of what people are voting for. I think we've got ample evidence that voting merely on the concept is not helpful, either in enabling informed choice by the voters or in ensuring a deliverable outcome. I did find myself wondering when I read that whether you could create some kind of amalgam between um, options one and two, where you could create a, a sequence of events where there would be a, initial discussions about the form any future United Ireland might take, and then have a referendum on whether that was the right form in a hypothetical sense, without voters having to express a view on whether the time was right to move towards it. This could theoretically at least be done well in advance of the point at which the conditions are met for a border poll and be followed in due course by the actual decisive referendum. Uh, but I accept that that's a resource intensive and politically charged idea and therefore probably unrealistic. But it highlights the challenge with all of this going forward and that is how to make debate on this possible in the real world where flag waving is a more accessible way of engaging in the debate than in delving into the intellectual detail. Given the level of contention surrounding the, con the sovereignty issue, I, I have a question about the degree to which it's realistic to expect either the Irish or British governments to devote significant headspace or resources to this matter ahead of the point at which the conditions for calling a border poll look likely to be met in the short term. And if it's not, how can you achieve that goal of clarity for voters so that they really know what they're voting for? And that is a sense, in a sense, is the biggest challenge that the final report will need to address. How could and should a constitutional project of this magnitude be taken forward in a way that ensures meaningful engagement and avoids it becoming a casualty of the short termist political horse trading, while also still happening within the dynamics of real world politics? There were two other things that I'd like to see tackled in a bit more detail in the final report. Um, 
The first is the, the nature of the post-transfer strand three relationships. There's a welcome nod to the importance of developing the East-West links in the interim report and an acknowledgement that this would be important in agreeing the form of post-transfer relationships between Great Britain and any future United Ireland. I think that needs to be fleshed out a bit more, particularly to ensure that those links continue to involve representatives from Northern Ireland, rather than just becoming relationships between the two sovereign governments, as they sometimes have in the past. The other issue is the legacy of the Troubles, um, which on my reading of the report was not covered in, in any in any meaningful way. There are obviously no easy answers here and possibly not even any easily defined questions, but that doesn't mean that we can take the easy approach of simply putting legacy matters into a box marked too difficult and leaving them on the shelf while we consider the less emotionally charged issues. And I'm sure that the report's authors will want to avoid that approach as they progress their work. So that, that was my comment. Incredibly valuable con contribution to the constitutional debate, but some significant further challenges to tackle as the working group moves forward into the next phase of its work. Thank you, Claire. That was terrific. And I can see Alan and Alan scribbling away. You've given them some uh, real pause for thought there. And we'll come back to uh, the, the two Alans after we've heard Martin's comments to get some of their initial reactions to what you're both um, saying. I'm sure that this is also stimulating lots of thought amongst members of the audience. And I'm not able to monitor how many of you have already sent questions to Connor. Uh, but before Martin um, takes over as the last speaker, I would just encourage people to start formulating some questions now, put them in the chat box to Connor Kelly. Uh, and of course, you, you can keep doing that when we're having the panel discussion. But um, uh, let's see your questions rolling in now. And uh, so finally, over to Martin. Thanks, Meg. Um, and can I just start by echoing what Claire has just said and congratulating the authors of the report on producing such a formidable uh, and comprehensive um, uh, e examination of this problem. It's terribly easy uh, when you write about politics and write about Northern Ireland, as I do and have done for many years, to sort of take for granted that as soon as you just mention something like a uh, unification referendum, uh, everybody understands exactly what that is uh, implies and exactly uh, how it might work. And the length of this report and the detail of this report uh, are a very, very valuable reminder uh, that that is far from being the case. Um, I, I think, I, I, but I would also echo what several of the speakers have said, which is that the crucial question uh, facing this, uh, anybody uh, who is dealing with this subject, uh, is how it will play in the real world. Um, and we've had that phrase already in the discussion. And on, on, on a general point on that, I'm reminded of what uh, General Eisenhower said in 1957 when he was president, uh, when he said that um, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. And uh, I don't mean to say that this plan is uh, worthless at all, but Eisenhower's real point was that you have to keep planning for something um, like this uh, if you're going to be able to uh, step up to uh, the, the situation when, it, when, when, it, when you're called upon to do so. Um, and, 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 and he says, you know, the first thing you do is when you, when you actually start is to take all the plans off the top shelf, throw them out the window. But if you haven't been planning, you can't start to work intelligently. And I think that's one of the great lessons of, of this report. Um, the, the report says, uh, and uh, uh, Alan Rennick said it at the start, that um, you know, the, the group had no collective view on whether such votes would be desirable and what the outcome should be if referendums were to be held. Uh, and that's obviously the good starting point for the report. The trouble is that in the real world, everybody else has both of those things. They both have a view on whether such votes are desirable and what the outcome should be if they were to be held. Um, and the report itself is re you know, realistic about this. and It admits it in, in chapter six when it's talking about um, uh, the, the, the reluctance, which was alluded to uh, earlier on. I mean, the reluctance of uh, unionists um, even to have a conversation about this uh, and equally the um, that uh, um, 
nationalists can equally be reluctant to uh, talk about changes to the union, um, uh, which might be in, taken as uh, uh, an approval of it or an, an, an attempt to enhance it. Um, but I think we need to have to we have to start by the fact that this would be a referendum like no other. Um, it, it, it's not just another referendum like the ones we've got used to uh, for good and ill in British politics in the last 30 years or so. Uh, it wouldn't be even like the Brexit referendum. When the rubber hits the road, this will matter very much indeed because uh, all kinds of things could follow from it, including s severe public disorder uh, and, and, and uh, danger. So, I mean, we just have to be realistic about that. You don't need to know too much so it helps to know a bit uh, about uh, uh, the history of Ireland and Britain to, to know that this is absolutely crucial. Um, so I think that protecting the neutrality of the process um, is going to be extraordinarily difficult. Um, and the, for that reason, I am personally uh, more in favour of, uh, of, of a two-part referendum process. I think the great lesson of the Brexit referendum was that a vote in principle uh, was not a vote on a detailed proposition. Um, the huge flaw in, in, in the Brexit legitimacy uh, process, which we're still living through uh, for more than four years later, uh, is precisely that we don't know exactly what it is uh, that we voted for um, or against, um, because that has yet to be revealed. Um, and, and I think that in the context of the Irish referendum, I would whether or not it is permitted under the uh, existing laws uh, governing these matters, it seems to me a two-part process uh, would be absolutely essential. Um, one would, the first referendum would, as it were, permit, uh, would decide whether there was to be a process at all, and the second would provide the detail, and it would only, and there would be a, uh, there would be what there hasn't been in Brexit, which is a uh, a referendum on what it actually uh, means. Um, the only other thing, uh, just two quick points I wanted to make uh, in addition. One is I think we haven't, the, the report does not mention German unification at all. And it seems to me that that is the one example within at least my lifetime uh, of, a, of a unification process of this kind. And there are great lessons to learn. Of course, there was no referendum, but the, there is a lot when perhaps we can bring this out in discussion. Um, and then uh, my, uh, my, my, my other point is, is uh, relates to chapter 14 of the, uh, of, of the report, which is on the campaign rules. And it's all very well to say that the, uh, you know, to insist that the British government uh, should stand by its 1993 position that it had no selfish strategic or economic interest in Northern Ireland. But it seems to me the reality in the referendum campaign, just as it was in the 2014 campaign in Scotland, uh, is that the UK government, even though it doesn't directly take part in the in the campaign, is a player. It's not just a referee. Um, it's hardly surprising uh, that it sh should have a view about the the uh, an alteration of the boundaries of its uh, of its state and, it, and 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 a change of sovereignty of part of its state. So I, I think more provision needs to be thought, but uh, considered in the. When, when the report is uh, in the final report on this question of um, the, enga uh, the engagement of, of, of UK politics, UK political parties and UK politicians in the campaign, because uh, I don't think we can assume that the rest of the UK will simply sit back uh, and uh, watch as, as events unfold and accept whatever is the outcome. Terrific. Thank you so much, Martin. What I'd like to do now is go back to um, the two Alans. I think I'll take them in the original order, uh, Alan Rennick first and then Alan Weissel, and invite you to respond to some of those points that have been made by, by Claire and Martin. Um, but let's try and keep this a conversation. I mean, it would be interesting to know what Perhaps Claire and Martin think that some of the answers are to their own questions. I'd love to know what Martin thinks the lessons are from German reunification, for example. So um, you don't necessarily have to do everything through the chair, 
you know, feel free to uh, have a discussion among yourselves on some of these points. Um, I'll, the, the default is I'll let the two Alans go first and then I'll come back to the two commentators and I'll try and also uh, nag you about any questions you overlook. But um, Alan Rennick, would you like to go first? Mm, those were great comments. Thank you so much to both Claire and Martin. Uh, really valuable to have these thoughts and we will think about them further after this. But just to attempt some initial reactions, I won't, I won't attempt to re respond to everything. Um, there are some points there that the other Alan is much better placed to respond to than I am. Um, both of you raised questions about uh, whether it would be possible to have uh, some kind of two-step referendum process, a process with two referendums. Um, and so this is quite a complex issue. Um, I should say, I guess I should say first that in, in my previous writings in other contexts, I have often argued in favour of two stage referendum processes. So I've argued that explicitly, for example, in relation to uh, the Scottish independence process, that um, having a process there where, whereby the, the, there's first a vote on the principle, and then there's a vote on whether you really want to go, go ahead once the, the detail has been worked out. Um, I, I've argued in favour of that in the Scottish context. Um, in the context of Northern Ireland, however, we do have, as Martin was hinting, the constraint of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And it seems to us clear in the agreement that you cannot have a process that uh, requires two votes in favour of unification before unification happens. The agreement is very clear that one vote for unification, both North and South, is sufficient for unification to take place. And you know we 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 could say well, you need to break out of the Good Friday Agreement in that case, um, but clearly the terms of the Good Friday Agreement were fought over very hard and were negotiated very hard I should say, uh, and uh, it seems highly unlikely to us that there would be agreement from all of those parties on changing that particular goalpost, uh, and and to, to try to do so. Uh, could give rise to great tensions. So it seems to us pretty clear that you cannot have a process in which you require two referendum votes for unification for unification to take place. Um, now, Claire had an interesting thought on a way in which you could nevertheless have a two referendum process that is sort of agreement compatible, uh, as it were, where, whereby you have a, a hypothetical vote on um, the form that unification might take place, it might take initially, and then you have the subsequent referendum under the uh, under the agreement, under the terms of the agreement. And in the report, we sketched out a possible alternative um, configuration of referendums that also would have a kind of setting the scene type referendum first, followed by the actual referendum under the agreement. But the setting the scene uh, referendum there would be one on whether to open negotiations. Uh, the, uh, the idea there, there, there being that essentially the, the job of negotiating all of this is a huge job and having a mandate from voters to do that first might, might be helpful. Um, Again, personally, I was quite favourable to that at the start, uh, but it became very clear and I was convinced by the members of the group that that would just not be tenable in the context of Northern Ireland because such a, a, a sort of preparatory vote would be seen too widely as in effect being the vote under the, unifi uh, under the agreement and, um, and it would cause great tensions again to, to try to do anything else. Uh, we do have some configurations that do have the possibility of a referendum at a later stage once the issue of, of unification has been decided, um, but I'm already talking for too long, so I won't go into further details on those. Just a couple of, couple of other things that I will pick up. Um, so Claire also talked about, the, so uh, Claire, Claire pointed out quite rightly, I think, um, that it, isn't it wouldn't be realistic to expect the governments to devote a lot of advanced headspace to this issue before we were in a context where it, it looked likely that a referendum was about to be called. And we very much agree with that. And we, you know, we don't call on the governments to start preparing um, at this stage. And then you raise the challenge, well, how, how in that case can voters get the information that they need? And we certainly think there's an important job to be done by academics, by civil society groups, by you know a range of different actors, um, 
in thinking through uh, what are the implications of different forms of unification? What, what you know, what 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 would the the financial implications be? What would the political constitutional implications be? You know, there's a lot of work that can be done um, without the governments becoming directly involved in that, and we think that would be helpful. I, I really liked Martin's phrase of from Eisenhower that plans are worthless, but planning is everything. Just that the process in itself of people thinking and having ideas and doing research and and discussions happen happening as well, you know, lots of conversations happening among people on the ground, not just among so supposed experts. Um, all of that could be really, really helpful. Finally, uh, on um, chapter 14 and Martin's point about uh, the role of UK politicians. Yes, I mean, I think it's entirely clear that uh, uh, UK politicians would get involved in the campaign and would uh, campaign, uh, many of them would campaign to maintain the union. And um, the, the, the referendum rules that exist in the UK are such that public money cannot be used in order to campaign on one side, um, but politicians, including politicians in government, can in their private capacity, though you know, no one would notice the difference, uh, uh, campaign. And I mean, I think you're right that just thinking through what that means in this particular context does require a bit more work. Uh, but uh, I, yes, I, I don't think it's an imaginable that politicians would not get involved uh, in Great Britain. Lovely, thank you, Alan. And uh, Alan Weissel, what thoughts do you have? I mean, particularly some of these challenges perhaps that Claire is raising about how you engage government insiders as a former government insider, you know, what is what is the right moment to get people thinking about this and how can you incentivize them to do so in an appropriate way? Do unmute. I am, I'm on YouTube, yes. Um, well, look, I, 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 as I say, I think it is some way off the stage where we need to plan, but to some degree, the, the possibility of a, bo a border poll becoming a reality is something that, 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 that ought to affect people's conception of politics and the need to start appealing across community divides, as, as most parties don't. Uh, and the need on the part of the British government, which frankly, uh, and objectively one can say, is widely mistrusted on all sides in Northern Ireland, uh, at present to, to, to start building trust because that's, that's, that's very important. Uh, if I pick up some of the, uh, Claire's comments, that just to endorse what Alan said, I think about the possibility of an, an advanced poll that isn't the real deciding poll. Uh, I think that isn't the agreement. And I think if it happened, but wasn't a, a affirmative results weren't followed automatically by unity, I think there's a real danger that nationalism would regard that as ratting on the agreement. Uh, and I think if there was a second poll coming up that could decide the question, it's also quite unlikely that you would get unionism engaging seriously on what a united Ireland should look like. So I'm not sure that in, the, in this context it is either the agreement or that it, it answers the questions. Uh, two things Claire is, well, Claire is always right, two things Claire is, is very right on. Uh, one is strand three, um, uh, the east-west relationship within which um, a, a, a united Ireland would figure. Uh, uh, that's a strand three east-west relations are a very important part of the agreement and you're entirely right I don't think we cover them in sufficient depth in this report and that is a mea culpa because uh, th these were bits of the report that I was I was set to do the initial drafting on I'm afraid by that stage I was rather running out of energy. Uh, there is a lot to be said about the possibilities of doing more things on a supranational level and particularly if you have an independent Scotland uh, so that there, there is a range of things there that, um, that, that, that ought to be looked at. Whether we will have time to look at them in, in the context of our final report to, 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 to a much greater degree, I'm not sure. Uh, I think Claire is also absolutely right about, about pointing up uh, the importance of legacy issues, the past, uh, uh, issues around victims, around unresolved cases and so forth. Uh, we did have a bit of a discussion of that. I think we would only ever have flagged it up in our report as something that needed to be considered in the context of unity. But I think it does absolutely need to be to be considered. It, it's not an issue that will simply go away. There are so many issues about political life in Northern Ireland that will it can't be assumed that unity is a, a universal solvent for. And this is this is certainly one of them. So I think we should we should flag that up. M Martin referred, and, and I can't remember quite what terms he, but you know, to the, the possibility that debate was destabilizing in the Northern Ireland context, or this is the, the suggestion that is made by some people on the union side. I think that debate is going on anyway. 
uh, and 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 you know the important thing is that it's an informed and comprehensive debate that looks at all the questions so uh, i think we are unapologetic about producing this report uh, in the terms that we have produced it i think it it, it feeds into a debate that is happening uh, and, and, and we hope that it may, may be a more useful debate as a result. But there also, as I suggest in my remarks, needs to be one on the other side of the argument about you know, a more perfect union, uh, uh, how we can really build on the, 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 the Good Friday Agreement, uh, putting aside, as it did rather, the old binary debate about constitutional status and working out how you can develop a, a polity within Northern Ireland that, that more successfully accommodates people's wishes, aspirations, uh, 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 really more, more commands their allegiance. And that may include much more uh, in the way of relations, thickening relations between North and South at government level and other levels, but uh, 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 that's a debate that's needed as well. Uh, just finally on the rest of the UK, uh, I agree, it would be helpful to have an informed debate in the rest of the UK. It has almost never happened on Northern Ireland issues, so I, 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 I'm aware really that there is not much understanding. We had, up until Brexit really, uh, not a lot of understanding in political circles about Northern Ireland, but a, a great, a, 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 an almost universal uh, acceptance that uh, you really needed to defer to the Good Friday Agreement and it was walking on eggshells and you should be very careful. I'm afraid since Brexit, some of that has, uh, that caution has been, has been lost. What would be really dangerous is if decisions that are made across the water about Northern Ireland appeared to be influenced by Scottish considerations, where I think there is much more of a, uh, a, 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 an interest, uh, an informed interest in, in the rest of the UK, uh, uh, and it's obviously rising to the top of agendas. Decisions about what to do in Northern Ireland must not be informed by uh, 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 motivations about uh, keeping Scotland within the Union. That would, be, that would be disastrous. I'm afraid it's all too easy to see politics drifting into that, but it, it really must not happen. Thank you so much, Alan. That's fascinating. Um, in a moment, I'll pass back um, to the commentators just very briefly to give us any reflections that they have on what they've heard. I'll, I'll start with Claire and then go to Martin. But I'm going to come back now and push uh, the first Alan, I think, on the unanswered question, which would have been one of my questions if I was in the audience and which Martin put in terms of, and I'm surprised you didn't pick it up, the extent to which the working group was able to learn from international experience. Martin specifically mentioned um, Germany, but I just wonder how much international experience there is of unification processes. Um, we've seen secession processes quite a lot around the world um, involving referendums, but it, you know, is, there, is there anything out there that you can draw on? We know Northern Ireland is unique, obviously, but just tell us a bit about that comparative context in response to Martin, and then, then I'll go back to the commentators. Mm. So the, the final section of chapter two, uh, if anyone wants to read it, uh, is an exploration of international experience of referendums that are comparable to this to this set of referendums. And there are very few so <coughs> that, are, that are really strongly comparable. So there are many, many referendums around the world that deal with sovereignty questions of some kind. So questions about independence, questions about um, a, a, an independent entity joining in with uh, a, another entity, an, another existing entity, something like EU membership uh, referendums that they can also be regarded as sovereignty referendums. So there are many referendums um, broadly of that uh, type. But there are very few referendums um, where the proposal is that uh, a territory would transfer from one sovereign entity to another sovereign entity. Uh, I forget exactly how many we found. Uh, it was maybe around 30 uh, that we found in total going all the way back to the late 18th century. Um, the vast majority of these um, were uh, before the uh, before the Second World War. Uh, there was a little gaggle of them shortly after the Second World War. Uh, the most there were two in the 1970s. One of them was the border poll in Northern Ireland in 1973, and then there was uh, a referendum in Sikkim in, if I remember correctly, 1975, on whether it should become part of the Indian Federation. 
So um, directly comparable referendums are rare. And then you have the addition that this would be a referendum that would be taking place on both sides of the existing border. Um, and that uh, I think is unique on a question such as this. Um, so there are some interesting uh, international lessons that, that can be drawn from the cases that we found. I mean, one point that, is, that comes across quite clearly from them is the principle of simple majority decision making applies across these referendums. So the principle that when you have a question of a basic sovereignty question, you have to resolve it by simple majority, because otherwise you're not treating the two options fairly and equally, essentially. Uh, that comes across pretty clearly. Um, but, uh, but you know, you, you can't take an off the shelf model of how to do a referendum like this. There isn't one. Thank you, Alan. Now, I'm, I'm advised by Connor that we've got plenty of audience questions. Um, if you do want to ask a question, um, send it in now because this is probably last call. Um, but I said that I would go back to the two commentators for very brief reflections on what they've heard uh, from the two members of the working group. Claire, would you like to say anything? Um, just briefly, um, I, I think I, I probably do agree with both Alans that, that my, my general musings about whether you could have a different type of two stage referendum would be would be problematic. Um, I think it's it's slightly different from the the two stage process that you've you've covered in the report, and I agree that that wouldn't be agreement compliant. But just whether there is any way of looking at this in a in a different way to to to, to create a, a an environment in which the debate can happen before you get to the point of taking the vote. Um, the other point, just to, to log, is I agree completely with, with Alan Weisel about Northern Ireland's future not being determined through the lens of GB views on Scottish independence. It's, it's hugely important that that, that isn't allowed to, to interfere with or influence the, the debate in relation to Northern Ireland. Terrific, thank you. And Martin, um, and I did warn you that if Alan didn't answer your question, I'd ask it you yourself about what we can learn from German unif unification. Uh, but what are your reflections on what you've heard? Well, very quickly, um, uh, I, I, I think on, 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 on the Republic of Ireland and the campaign, we didn't, I didn't say anything about the Republic of Ireland's role in the campaign in Northern Ireland. I think uh, but, but I think that uh, what Alan said in response to what I said about UK politicians will also have to apply very um, realistically uh, to political parties and politicians from the Republic. And um, it, it, I mean, it's quite obvious, given that in at least the case of Sinn Féin, the party exists on a 32 county basis. Um, uh, and, and I think I'm right in saying that Fianna Foyle has been toying with the idea of becoming a 32 county party again, but I'm not certain about that. Forgive me if that's wrong. Um, on Scotland, can I just say, I mean, the order in which events take place is going to be crucial here. Um, if there is a Scottish referendum, which goes whichever way it goes, uh, before there is a Northern Ireland referendum, whichever way that goes, that's going to have a different uh, impact to the, to, uh, uh, to, to, to the reverse, to an, a Northern Ireland re uh, referendum taking place before a, a Scottish referendum. Um, just an obvious point, but one that needs to be factored in, I think. And my final point, just quickly, uh, is, is just on Germany. One, I mean, the point I would say about Germany, where, why it is interesting and important, I mean, quite apart from the fact that it's Germany, um, you know, which is kind of important <laughs> in anybody's way of looking at uh, these things, um, is that unification in Germany in 1990 was preceded by uh, quite a lot of gradual convergence and cooperation in other things, what you might call West-East um, uh, discussions and uh, co collaboration, including, including economic and monetary union. Um, and and the, these questions are not off the table in the context of uh, of Northern Ireland uh, in the light of Brexit. So I think, um, you know, the, the, there, is, there is something to be looked at there. That was really my main point about, the, about, about Germany is simply that uh, it, got, it got there at the end of a process, not as the start of the process. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Martin. That's a really interesting point about convergence and something I was wondering when looking at the report earlier as to how, uh, how the Republic of Ireland might start behaving in the run up to a possible referendum and you know the, the rights and wrongs of that uh, as well. So maybe that's something you'll want to pick up on um, during the rounds of questions. But I think we should go to the audience because we've got lots of questions now. Um, let's invite Connor to join us. And I think Connor will probably suggest sort of two, three, four questions um, together in, in groups that make sense. And then I'll put them back to the panel and I'll start with Alan Weissel this time. I'll, I'll start with the uh, working group members on each round. I'll start with Alan Weissel and then Alan Rennick and then um, open up to the other two. So Connor, what have you got? Yeah, uh, we've got lots of interesting questions coming in. Um, so please do keep them coming in. Um, I think we'll start off um, with two questions that are closely related to each other. Um, the first is, have the working group considered the changing demographics of Northern Ireland and whether or not that might weigh on the Secretary of State's thinking about calling a border poll? Um, a second question is related to that and it asks whether or not ultimately the assembly vote is all that will matter in triggering a, a Secretary of State to call a referendum. And then uh, quite a tricky question that I know the working group have considered is, what would happen if Northern Ireland voted to unify, but the Republic of Ireland rejected uh, the unification plan? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, some big questions there. So I, I said I'd start with Alan Weissel. What would you like to tell us about your conclusions on those things, Alan? Right. Um, did we consider changing demographics? Yes, we did. And there is a, a section in our report about it. Um, uh, and, and I think we consider that by themselves they didn't change, tell us very much and there is a possibility that the, the census to be conducted next year will show a Catholic majority for the first time. But you know we, we are not purely tribal, there is now a, a very large middle ground in Northern Ireland, uh, in, in Northern Ireland politics of people in parties like the Alliance Party and the Green Party which draw support very much from both sides of the community. So mere demographics by themselves I think don't tell you very much and shouldn't weigh with the Secretary of State very much. They, they, they may to some degree, you know, uh, 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 they ought to impact on the wider politics and people's realisation that things are potentially changing. Uh, there are new, new challenges in politics to be addressed, but I don't think it, it goes much more than that. I mean, is this a vote in the Assembly all that ultimately matters? Well, I don't think it can be as a matter of law. I mean, the Secretary of State is, I mean, the agreement doesn't say it's a matter for a vote in the Assembly. Uh, it says the Secretary of State has to consider how people would vote in a border poll. Uh, and uh, legally and, and, and as a matter of propriety, he really needs to consider uh, a, a whole range of evidence in that. But as I said in my remarks, I think a, a vote in the Assembly ultimately makes a big difference uh, as regards the Secretary of State's decision whether there is a majority for unity. He has to weigh very heavily uh, the views expressed by um, members of the Assembly who have been elected by the, the people of Northern Ireland. Uh, but we are some way from that. Uh, but e even you know, if there were a vote in the Assembly, whether or not he thought that there was a, a, that meant that a majority would vote for unity, he might well think that as a matter of his discretion, uh, 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 politics was up in the air until the, the situation was resolved and so it would be right to, to proceed to a border poll anyway. Um, uh, uh, yes, the, the, the problem of split votes, uh, what happens if Northern Ireland votes to unify and the Republic of Ireland doesn't? Uh, I, I'm not sure, we have a section on this in the report, uh, I'm not sure that we have uh, we have been able to, to, to game it through to the ultimate degree and potentially it is extremely destabilizing. Uh, you have a situation where Northern Ireland, as it were, is an orphan. Uh, it doesn't want to be in Britain, but <laughs> nobody else wants it. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and potentially destabilizing and, and, and needing a, a, lot of, a lot of political handling. Uh, I, I mean, all the polling suggests that there is a, a continuing majority in the South for unity. Uh, but how far that will survive the debate, a more informed debate, is a question that I think is, is open. Uh, uh, there is, you, you get the sense talking to people in Dublin, you know, there is, uh, there is, uh, there is slightly a, a message in some circles, Lord make me unified but not yet. 
um, uh, the potential impact of bringing three quarters of a million recalcitrant uh, British feeling people from Northern Ireland into their well-functioning state is, um, it, it, it is potentially quite a serious one. Uh, so you know, the, all the more important therefore that we have the debate um, uh, and that we get a, a more a, 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 a clearer sense of opinion on both sides of the border because inevitably they impinge on one another. I have gone for too long. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, they were three quite precise questions, and I think Alan Weisel's given us quite a good rundown of they're all covered in the report, what the report says. But Alan, Alan Rennick, is there anything else that you'd like to add? And then I'll briefly turn to the other two panelists to see if they'd like to suggest anything. Um, I mean, that was quite a quite a thorny political point that we ended on there. People may have reflections on that. Alan. Um, I have nothing to add to what Alan said on the first two questions. I entirely agreed with everything he said on all three questions. <laughs> Just to add a little more on the third question. Uh, uh, so clearly, if the North votes for unification, and the South votes against unification, we should say unification does not happen. So it is very clear in the agreement that uh, unification requires majorities both North and South. And that is the case even if there is an all Ireland, all Ireland majority, all Ireland majority for unification. So, you know, the, there may be some who think that politically speaking, because there's an all Ireland majority, unification should happen. It's very clear that the, in the agreement, that is not sufficient. Um, and one of the points that we make in the in the report is that we think it would be very desirable uh, at the start of a referendum campaign for all of the parties concerned to kind of sign up to a statement saying that they will respect the result as determined under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, uh, in order to just emphasize that point. Um, there's also an interesting question of, so what does happen? <laughs> Unification doesn't happen. What What kind of procedurally does happen um, if the South votes no. And given past experience of uh, referendums in the South on EU treaties, it might be thought that you can have a quick kind of renegotiation of some of the terms and have a quick further referendum and get the majority for unification in the South, particularly if the margin first time round was quite tight. Um, it's very clear that that cannot happen in this case. Uh, and that is because um, uh, 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 under the, the, there's a provision in the in the agreement that requires the referendums both north and south essentially to be on the same terms. It's the concurrence principle in the agreement. So if you change the terms in the south, you would have to have a further referendum in the north. But uh, another of the provisions in the agreement is that you cannot have a further referendum in the north uh, in less than seven years, even if there has been a majority in favour of unification in the first referendum. So um, essentially, there is no quick fix to that situation uh, under the agreement. And the sorts of political considerations that Alan raised, therefore, become very important. Thank you. Um, Claire or Martin, would you like to come in and offer any reflections on any of these points? Just briefly to, to agree with what the two Allens have, have said, but particularly on that, that last point, it really, really underlines the importance of having a full and thorough debate in advance of the referendum so that people are really clear on what they're voting for. And there's been an opportunity to test and refine proposals at that stage. Thank you. Martin? I'm happy to move on to more questions so that I'm not uh, delaying uh, other participants from having their contribute, making their contributions. Okay, in which case, thank you very much. Let's go back to Connor. What have you got? Yes, we've got a couple of more interesting questions come through. Um, so the first one is quite a tricky one. It says, if it is impossible to get serious engagement by unionists in contemplating the nuts and bolts of the United Ireland, do you see ways in which nationalists or those in favour of unity might get adequate engagement from unionists on some of these questions. Um, the second question is, given um, the experience in Scotland in which campaigning increased support for independence from 25% in opinion polls to 45% on the day of the vote, is the Good Friday Agreement criterion for calling a poll unfair by effectively expecting unification to win the argument uh, before official campaigning has begun. Uh, and a third question, which is also related to Scotland, a couple of people have asked this actually, is are there lessons from the report which have a broader um, 
relevance to other referendums that might take place, specifically a further referendum on Scottish independence. Oh, tricky stuff there. Thank you very much, Connor. <laughs> um, I think I should go to Alan Rennick first um, on, on this round, just to keep swapping things around. But um, I don't envy you, Alan. What would you like to say? <laughs> yes, if, any, if anyone thought we might be only asking the easy easy questions uh, by, by having Connor as our filter, I think you can see that that is not the case. So really good questions, though. Um, I might um, I might leave the first one mainly to the other Alan uh, because he has a lot of expertise in that area. Uh, just to take the other two questions um, on the so the third question was about broader relevance to other referendums. That's a yeah that's a really interesting question that to be honest I haven't really thought about. I mean. The process that I have gone through with this is essentially that a few years ago we ran a project looking at referendums across across the UK with the Independent Commission on Referendums, and in that project we quite deliberately didn't look at referendums on this question in Northern Ireland because we recognised that they were unique and presented their own challenges. So this report. It essentially came from a process of wanting to to focus in on these particular referendums, but certainly my my views have been changed by all the work that we have done on this report over the past year, and I think we do probably now need to do a further round of reflection and think what are the the implications. And uh, <clears throat> I'd be interested actually in what Meg says in response to this question because Meg was involved with the Independent Commission as well and is looking at the working group slightly from, from outside. I think I'm too inside. The working group just at the moment to see those wider implications but Meg probably has a, a greater ability to see them so I'd be interested. Um, in terms of the the shift in support that was seen in the Scottish referendum so yes there was a big shift in support for unification sorry not for unification for independence uh, during the Scottish independence referendum. Uh, if you look comparatively across all referendums around the world that's quite unusual uh, so about two thirds of all of the referendums. So we, we've actually separately done a, a project that is, isn't yet published, uh, but we've done a project recently looking at how opinion changes during referendum campaigns. And in about two thirds of referendums around the world where we found enough polling evidence to be confident, uh, opinion shifts towards the status quo during the campaign period. Um, however, there, there are a lot of exceptions, about a third of referendums do go the other way, and it's, there's some evidence to suggest that referendums on these big kind of sovereignty questions might be particularly likely to go the other way. Um, uh, or, or just not to see much opinion change at all. So the summary of that is there's no justification from the existing evidence, the comparative evidence that would justify the Secretary of State in kind of presuming that opinion is likely to shift in a particular direction over the course of the campaign. Um, and therefore, you know, th th really the Secretary of State needs to take account of the opinion, the, the evidence that exists at the time from opinion polls, from surveys, from election results. And Alan, as Alan Weishaw said, from what politicians themselves think. And, uh, you know, politicians are, are important in shaping opinion during a campaign period. So if a lot of politicians would like there to be a referendum and would like unification, then that might be an indication of where opinion might shift over the course of a campaign period. But you certainly can't make any precise extrapolations. And you've clearly in this case got the, the rather unique constraint that you can't hold another referendum for seven years. Um, and therefore, in a sense, if you go too early, you could be accused as a Secretary of State of scuppering the process. Um, very, very delicate. Yeah, and it's clear that you know if the Secretary of State deliberately went early in order to scupper the process, that would be illegal. Uh, and there was a court case, uh, the McCord case, um, where the judgment was quite explicit about that point. Mm. So the Secretary of State needs to be careful. So Alan Rennick threw um, the, the difficult question about unionist engagement back to Alan Weissel when it struck me, and this is maybe partly, he also threw a question to me, which I think is completely unfair as, as, as chair. Um, but um, I mean, one of the things that strikes me when reading chapter nine is that there is a, a basic conundrum here, which we faced on Brexit. And I think you face it on Scottish independence as well. Um, and you face it here all in their very different ways. 
as to how to engage the fundamentally reluctant in thinking through the practicalities of a vote for change and how you trade that off against providing certainty for voters. And that's the way I read chapter nine, that essentially you either have to devise something, um, a, a solution in which a really important part of the community is not engaging in that design, which is inadequate, or you have to not have a design ready, which makes it very difficult for the voters. So, so Alan, how, how do you think you go about squaring those circles? Yeah, well, I, as I said, we say so my earlier remarks, you know, there is no perfect way of squaring these and all the, the suggestions we have come up with are highly imperfect. And because they're complicated processes, they, they, they carry risks themselves of, 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 of potentially falling over, which is why it's very important that the governments, I think, as they always have at a time, at times when we have had political advance in Northern Ireland are ready to work together to keep the process on, on, on the rails. But I mean, if unionists won't engage, what, what will you do? As I say, I think it's entirely understandable that they won't engage on the design of a united Ireland uh, before a united Ireland is certain. Uh, after it's certain, uh, then they will have strong reasons of self-interest uh, to, 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 to engage in that way. And, and, and you would hope that at that stage that, 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 that they would uh, and that mechanisms are provided uh, that permit them to do that effectively not to exercise a veto over over unity at all but to you know so far as possible produce title deeds for a new state that they can put their signature on uh, uh, that's the ideal uh, 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 and we should try to work towards that i don't think there are any proxies for unionist engagement i mean you hear sometimes the suggestion that you know if unionists won't engage in the advance of an advance of debate we'll have a citizens assembly uh, uh, in which uh, to, to, to which people will be invited in from all parts of the community. Now we say in the report the citizens' assemblies might well have a role in part of the the fleshing out the the possible design of a of a united Ireland. But to put all the weight on that, and to suppose that having a few people drawn from the unionist tradition on the citizens' assembly is an effective proxy for engagement by the political representatives of the unionist community, I, I don't think works. Uh, so, uh, uh, as I say, no, no easy answers. Uh, the second point I think was about, um, uh, 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 yes, the possibility of increased support in, in campaigns. The Secretary of State's decision is a very difficult one because as a matter of law, it appears to be uh, that he is attempting before a campaign has begun to forecast the result of a poll at the end of a campaign. Uh, and that is really very, very difficult indeed. You know, it adds an extra dimension. Uh, uh, it just points up again the importance of having a thorough thrashing out of the issues before we come to the point at which the Secretary of State makes his decision. And we suggest in the report that it is reasonable for him to take a certain time uh, in, in making his decision, but he really mustn't go on too long uh, 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 after the point at which, you know, the indicators start to be in the direction of, of 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 a vote for for uh, a likely vote for unity uh, but and and if there were an assembly vote as i suggest that that to some degree transforms the environment and 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 and, and, and transcends that question uh, but it is an exceptionally difficult decision and we, we must condemn those in the northern ireland office who were responsible for this text at the time I feel maybe there are some accusations flying around among the panel here. Um, <laughs> 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 um, Martin, do you have any reflections on these points? And then I'll turn to Claire. I know you both have a, an interest in Scotland, uh, but these are fascinating questions across the board. Yeah, on, on the question of um, the, the, the relationship between calling a referendum and then the likely uh, or potential outcome of the referendum and whether the system that, that currently exists in relation to a Northern Ireland referendum uh, is, is, is biased against the, uh, 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 the possibility that uh, it might actually end up by voting for unification uh, because opinion would uh, change during the campaign. Uh, I mean, that's clearly one possibility, but it's one possibility amongst many others. And I, I'm, I, I would be very cautious in simply assuming that that's the case. Um, if you look at, uh, I mean, before the Brexit referendum, 
I heard so many political scientists uh, say what Alan Rennick said a few minutes ago, that you know, as referendums get closer to the wire, uh, the status quo uh, wins. Uh, and, and of course, uh, that didn't happen in the Brexit referendum at all. So you know, that, that assumption proved completely wrong in that case. But it's, it's often been argued, I mean, I'm not, adv I'm not saying this is right, uh, in either case, that in both the Scottish referendum and the Brexit referendum, the, um, the anti-status quo vote uh, increased at the end because of the general expectation that the status quo would win. And therefore, you know, the, the, you know I think it becomes a really difficult thing to I, I think you're, you're not standing on dry land really when you when you start making those kind of guesses I, I wanted just to throw one other thought into this which has only occurred to me while we've been having this conversation which is simply that what, what happens if in Northern Ireland at some future stage there is a Sinn Féin led um, uh, Northern Ireland executive in a Shin, in a uh, Northern Ireland assembly in which Sinn Féin is the largest single party, and Sinn Féin has campaigned in that in the preceding election on the basis that there will be a referendum. Um, what do the those who are more expert than I am think the pressures on the Secretary of State uh, would be, and would that change anything that we've been uh, talking about for the last uh, hour or so. That's a further big difficult question as if we didn't have enough already. Um, Claire, you don't have to answer that question, but you might like to pick it up and um, your reflections on what was discussed um, earlier in this round. Um, well, I'll certainly start with looking at the, the, the earlier um, earlier questions. I think the two Alans have, have more or less said everything that I would have said on there. But on the second question, I think it is a very pertinent question, but it, it underlines the importance of Polling, opinion polling not being the only factor that the Secretary of State would take into account. He would need to triangulate over a, a range of evidence in coming to in coming to that decision. The other um, factor, and I think Martin was slightly alluding to this um, in terms of the, the independence referendum and also the, the Brexit referendum, there's an element of wanting to kick the establishment in, in, in voting for, for the, the option that is not the status quo. Um, in a situation where it was a, a vote relating to the unification of Ireland, you have two separate establishments, both of which might be considered to have different interests in the outcome, and therefore you couldn't kick you couldn't kick them both simultaneously, and and therefore the, the chances of of that protest vote um, being a factor might be less than. Than than others, I think I might defer to the two Allens to pick up on on Martin's. Um, uncollegiate um, challenge of adding in extra questions to the tricky ones we've already got. And I think I might then, um, rather than prolonging this, because I've got my eye on the time, um, suggest that Connor gives us another round and that maybe the Allens pick that up as part of the next round so as um, to make sure that we get back to the audience at least one more time. Um, it's a bit tight here as to whether we're going to get one more round of questions or two more rounds of questions. So let's see how the next one goes. If they're quick and simple ones, we might get a our final round in after this one. But Connor, tell us. Yes, so this next round are all questions that are related to the nature of and the dynamics of um, a referendum campaign itself. So the first one is, given the history of boycotts in Northern Ireland, what would be the implications in terms of the legitimacy of the process itself if there were a nationalist or a unionist boycott this time around? Um, the second question is, have the working group considered uh, the dynamics of um, campaigning groups operating on both sides of the border during a referendum campaign. And finally, have the working group considered the ability of people to vote on both sides of the border? Uh, terrific, thank you. Um, in order to speed things up a bit, um, I mean, the two of those sound very much like um, in, they're in the Rennick realm. <laughs> Um, in terms of the sort of specific regulation of campaigning, the campaign rules. Um, I'm sure he'd want to say something about the boycotts as well, but why don't I go to Alan Weissel and ask him particularly to comment on the, the issue of boycotts and then anything brief on the campaign rules and then I'll go to Alan Rennick. 
Yes, well, the, the issue of boycotts is a, is a real one. I think it's probably less likely in current circumstances. I mean, 1972, nationalism boycotted the referendum, but the, the result was a perfectly foregone conclusion. Uh, it, it was clear in the, in the politics and the demographics of the time that there was going to be a, a, vote, for, a, a vote for the union. Uh, that is less likely to be true this time, but um, we, 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 we don't know where it would be. It would be a bad sign. It would be a sign that people were uh, abandoning um, uh, uh, really the constitutional route that is laid down. Uh, I think it's unlikely probably that either of them would do that. Uh, 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 but it's it's it it is a serious a serious possibility. Just to pick up Martin's uh, point about Sinn Fein being being the largest party in the Northern Ireland Assembly, uh, there's also the, the possibility that that Sinn Fein will also be the the lead party or one of the lead parties in government in the South as well. Um, uh, I don't think either of those things necessarily makes a border poll uh, uh, an inevitability. Um, uh, uh, unless Sinn Féin were 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 fifty percent, uh, or unless nationalist parties were 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 fifty percent of the electorate, fifty percent of the uh, of the members returned to to the assembly, and and that is that is some way away. As uh, if if that were so, if the election results were that way, if the assembly voted by fifty percent uh, in favour of a, of a border poll, as I suggest, that 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 does transform things radically. Um, but, you know, it is quite, quite possible at the next election that we will have a Sinn Féin, uh, Sinn Féin as the largest party in the Assembly and therefore the people who, who propose the First Minister. But in the, in the system we have here, you know, that doesn't mean they're top dog. Um, uh, uh, well, they're, 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 they're slightly the highest, higher of the dogs, but the dogs are, the, the two top dogs are already slightly primus inter pares and, and nominate the First and Deputy First Ministers who have equal and joint powers. So uh, uh, it's, it, it would be a change in the dynamic, but not perhaps a fundamental one. Uh, I'll, I'll leave the other two questions to, to Alan in the interest of time, I think. Great. So, Alan, you've got um, some stuff about campaign regulation on both sides of the border and, um, I guess, voter registration as well. Uh, yes, so on the campaign issue, so I mean, it's clear that there could well be uh, groups that are campaigning on both sides of the border, particularly if the votes were to take place on the same day, which is, is a possibility, though not a requirement. Um, and uh, there is a difficulty here in that the regulations on campaign groups are very different on the two sides of the border. So in the UK, there are um, limits on how much campaign groups can spend but there are no limits on how much can be donated to campaign groups. In Ireland, there are limits on how much can be donated to campaign groups, but no limits on how much can be spent by campaign groups. And there is clear scope for playing of the rules uh, um, around this. And to be honest, I think we haven't really worked that out in as much detail as we need to yet in, in the current chapter 14 of the report. I think it's an issue that we probably need to return to. Um, but uh, in order to ensure that there is fairness between all camp campaigners in the campaign, which is the fundamental principle, that does need attention. On the issue of people being able to vote on both sides of the border, so it would be the case if the so we, we so the, the default franchise in Ireland would be the standard referendum franchise would be applied. Uh, we we think the default franchise in the UK would be the franchise for the Northern Ireland Assembly. So the, the, the default franchise in Northern Ireland would be the franchise for the Northern Ireland Assembly. It is the case that some people would satisfy the residency requirements for both of those franchises and we would therefore be able to vote in both uh, referendums and a view has to be taken on whether people are, think that's acceptable or not. Uh, it was possible for some people to vote in both referendums in 1998. Uh, uh, it would be possible again if nothing were done about it. For, from one point of view it's not problematic at all. There are two polities, two, two communities of voter, voters who are making decisions separately from each other and if one person happens to be a member of both of those then fine, just as you can vote in local elections in two different places in the UK. Um, uh, another view says that uh, uh, this is essentially one decision being taken by the people for Ireland with two separate majorities, but essentially one decision. And on that conception of what is involved here, uh, um, 
it would be undesirable for people to be able to vote both north and south of the border. So there's a kind of fundamental philosophical question there about what this referendum actually is. Great, thank you very much. Um, Claire, would you like to comment on these points? Um, I think Alan Weisel has said everything that I would have, but with some added dog metaphors, so I'll leave it. <laughs> <laughs> and Martin. Just that Alan Weisel's comments about the, the, a, a boycott being a very bad sign uh, are obviously true, and I, I defer to him in, in, ju in his judgment about whether that would actually happen. But I mean, as the questioner suggested, you know, boycotts do have a, a long history in not just in Ireland, but also in other referendums, see Catalonia, for instance. And um, I'd have thought that the chances of it happening uh, would be quite high. Terrific. Thank you very much. Now, we're running very short of time and I'm a bit nervous about going to um, another round of questions because we normally finish our events at quarter past uh, the hour um, and we certainly don't go beyond the half hour. So I wonder whether perhaps it might be more appropriate just to ask the panel to reflect broadly on, um, on what we've heard today and what happens next, particularly maybe to hear from the two Allens about whether, you know, this has sparked any new thoughts and what the next stages of the project are. I'm, I'm getting a little bit nervous that there are lots of things that people have said um, aren't completely fleshed out in the report and need further consideration. It's already 250 pages long. Um, so what happens next? Maybe that maybe the two maybe the two um, outside speakers would just like to say whether they've got any final thoughts on what they've heard and then I'll turn to the two Alans to wrap up. Martin? Yeah, um, let me just throw in one thing I was going to say right at the start but didn't talk about, which is simply the, the online campaigning and the finances of the, uh, of, of the campaign itself. It's all chapter 14 of the report stuff. And I, I think what Alan Rennick said about, you know, there being some, some areas that really do need to be uh, explored in more depth is, is, is right. I mean, put it crudely, I mean, there are international and national players who have an interest in the outcome of this uh, this um, debate uh, of, of this referendum and uh, clearly the the, 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 pr the process needs to be protected as much as it possibly can be in, be in this day and age that's really all I wanted to say but I, I think it doesn't really require a reply because I think it was sort of in prefigured by something Alan Rennick said a few minutes ago. Mm. I was very much reflected in the um, the, the um, independent commission on referendums as well. Yeah, Claire. I, I think that the, the quality of uh, the and the complexity of the questioning highlights the, the importance of continuing this this discussion. And I think um, hopefully Con Connor has got the the list of all the other questions that that we haven't had time to cover here, and we'll be able to feed those into the the working group as they they go forward. Thank you, Alan Weissel. I, I, I think what we have heard, have heard you know, points up the importance of, of, of more debate, more discussion, more informed discussion. Uh, some people suggesting our report isn't, com isn't complex enough already. Um, it's entirely right, of course, that there is much more, much more to be done to flesh out a lot of these questions. On the other hand, uh, you know, it, it's already much of it is very dense. I, I found some of the legal analysis, which is brilliant, uh, nevertheless very difficult to, to come to terms with. So. The way in which these questions, these considerations are presented into debate, I think is, is, is important. And it's, it's uh, you know, finding ways of communicating accessibly um, some of the rather complicated questions and getting them discussed is, is one of the real challenges as well as digging, digging into, into the detail. Um, uh, uh, just to pick up what, one, one point of Martin's, I, I think it will be interesting to see what we get from America. Uh, the Biden camp is really, uh, you know, the president-elect's camp is really very, very interested in Irish questions. Very, very interesting that, you know, his phone calls on day two, uh, I think on day one he called Mexico and Canada, day two was France, Germany, Britain and Ireland. Uh, and he, um, they're, they're, now, uh, I, I, I think it's very unlikely that there is going to be an activist intervention saying you must have a border poll soon or anything of that sort. Uh, uh, but uh, there may well be an interest in active facilitation of 
really putting putting new flesh on the on the bones of the of the Good Friday Agreement, which American diplomacy regards quite rightly to some degree as 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 its triumph. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, uh, if anything is done in the Brexit context by the British government uh, that makes things more difficult here, uh, that I think will not be not be not be regarded favourably in America. Thank you very much. And finally, Alan Rennick. Thank you. Yes, we've had great comments here. Thank you so much both to Claire and to Martin for their comments, but also all the questions from the audience, which have been great. I think um, I've been given particular reason to think further about the configurations of referendums and how you can do those, how you can address the fundamental trade-off that uh, Meg has characterised so accurately. That's a, a, a fundamental challenge. And then also um, a number of points have been raised about campaigning and the regulation of the campaigns. And we have generally said that we're not suggesting that the governments should start planning or preparing uh, at this stage. And that is a really important point in the report. Um, but with regard to improving the rules for the conduct of election and referendum campaigns in the UK, there is absolutely no reason to wait at all. Uh, and uh, going into a Northern Ireland referendum with the current rules would be uh, um, highly irresponsible, but uh, going into any further major election or referendum with the current rules is um, quite wrong and the government really needs to move quickly on that. Uh, just final comment, this is, as we've said repeatedly, an interim report uh, with draft conclusions at this stage, so we're very, very keen to hear from as many people as possible and Charlotte, under the name of tech support, has put into the, into the chat uh, the email address uh, at which we will be very grateful to receive comments. So any comments that we do receive by the 18th of January, we will be able to take into account uh, as we finalise the, the final version of this report, which we will try not to make too much longer than the current version. But thank you so much. This has been really a great discussion. Thank, thank you very much. Well, just to, just to wrap it up, um, let me add my thanks uh, to Alan's in thanking all of the speakers um, for participating today, thanking the audience for coming and for the excellent questions, thanking Connor for fielding the questions and indeed Charlotte and others behind the scenes for their tech support. Um, as I said at the beginning of the event, uh, we are recording. Um, and the recording will be made available on our website as soon as possible. Um, and we will actually let you know as members of the audience when it is available. So if you've enjoyed this event, then do feel free to share the link so that uh, friends and colleagues can listen to it, watch it afterwards. Um, and indeed, I did say at the beginning that this is the second of three events. Um, if you enjoyed this, uh, or if you attended and were frustrated that you didn't manage to get your question in, uh, there is an event happening next week hosted by Belfast. Um, I haven't got the details in front of me, but if you go to our website, uh, or particularly if you go to our Twitter feed, you'll be able to find details of that. And indeed, as I speak, Charlotte's maybe busy putting it in the chat. Um, as Alan said, um, you can find the report on our website. Um, do feel free, and indeed we encourage you to uh, send in written comments. Um, I, I also didn't thank the members of the working group, uh, because some of them are in the audience, as well as on the panel. Um, and as I said at the beginning, I applaud all of the uh, work that they've done. Um, and the final thing to do um, is to remind you that if you're not already on the mailing list to hear about the Constitution Units events, please do go to our website and register for uh, emails about future events. And of course, if you do that, you'll be able to hear when the final report of the working group comes out, which is going to be sometime later in 2021. So. Thank you all, and I hope to see you at a future Constitution Unit event.